Hello again, welcome, it is I, Freezer700, and today we are going to be talking about a Space Marine chapter that I find very unique. Now this chapter is unique in the sense that they're a little weird, and by weird I mean fucking weird. This chapter is, well, their second founding chapter. So they're old, they've been around for a long time. But where do they come from? They come from the Ultramarines. Now, being from the Ultramarines is very significant, because just about every fucking chapter is from the Ultramarines. But, more importantly, where do they reside? Right now they reside on the world Ithaka, which is an ocean world. So it has a few islands that are of considerable landmass, actually. Um, some of these islands are pretty big, kind of like Australia. But primarily this place is all water. Now this water, though, actually produces a lot of tsunamis. In fact, the tsunamis are kilometers tall. So these are pretty big. These are bigger than the Empire State Building. These are huge waves crashing on these islands. Some of the waves take over the whole island entirely. So the humans who live here aren't technologically advanced. It's a feral world. But the beliefs of these people have kind of infected the chapter itself. As with every chapter that recruits locally from one world and only that world, the beliefs of the people will start to seed into the chapter itself. Now, unlike the Mortificators, the Mortificators changed a little bit. They changed pretty good to the point that the Ultramarines don't like them, but not to this extent. This is a severe change. It's what led some people to theorize that the Iron Snakes aren't from the Ultramarines at all. But let's talk about the world again. So besides being just straight up water and islands, what does the world have that is really dangerous to the people aside from the environment? Well, they have giant sea dragons. Now the giant sea dragons are called worms. These worms are pretty nasty, they're pretty big. And some of them even group up in massive herds. Now these worms have really more of a religious context to them than anything. And as I've said before, the tribes of the people who live on this world have rather infected the roots of the iron snakes. So now their beliefs are very similar. But aside from the world itself, what makes these guys unique? Well, they're from Robert Gilliman, and it does show they're very well disciplined. They know how to unload and reload their rifles perfectly efficiently, well disciplined, line of fire, everything. Great. They listen to the chain of command with no questions. Great. They don't excel at anything. So they're exactly like the Ultramarines. They're versatile. They're good at everything. They're not particularly good at one thing or the other. They're just average. But here's where it gets a little weird. Unlike the Mortificators, the Mortificators take the Codex Astartes as guidelines. They'll listen to it occasionally when it makes sense. The Iron Snakes don't listen to it at all. They don't even follow its basic tenets. This is very intriguing for a Gilliman group to not support the Codex Astartes at all. In fact, the basic Codex Astartes demands that a chapter be broken into 10 companies. Even the Imperial Fist follow this guideline, where it's 10 companies, 100 Space Marines per company. Not this chapter. This chapter doesn't do companies. It does squads. Does 10-man squads called Fatry Squads. I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that, but you get the picture. And these squads consist of one apothecary and one support. Now, the apothecary is the medic. And it's rather interesting that they have this because this means that they are probably the highest amount of apothecaries out of every Space Marine chapter we've ever seen. Because it's one apothecary per nine Space Marines. Not one apothecary per 100. No, it's one per nine. So this means that they have an ass ton of apothecaries. So if you ever get shot and you're saying, I need healing, there's definitely going to be a medic around. But they also have one support, and this support usually is a specialist in plasma guns or flamethrowers. Those are typically the iconic weapons of these guys, is plasma and flamethrowers. So flamethrowers is good for dealing with unarmored, massive groups of targets, and plasma is good against space marines, tanks, 
Anything that's got thick armor, this is what the plasma is good for. Now, the squads themselves are a really fascinating subject to talk about. Because the names of the companies is usually like first company, second company, whatever. The squads aren't named this way. The squads are named after the leaders of the squad. So if my name is Nathaniel and I am the leader of this squad, the squad's name is Nathaniel Squad. So the squads are actually very unique and individualistic. In fact, most of the time, if you're part of the squad, you're gonna probably die in the squad because no one really switches squads. It's usually a very tight-knit group of 10 guys. So what, what weapons do these guys use that makes them interesting? Well, they use rather interesting war gear. They use these things called sea lancers, which are huge fuck-off spears power spears to be exact and they also use smaller swords called war blades war blades is the same as a power sword it's just smaller so overall though i keep saying that the sea dragons the worms as they are called and the sea lancers and the world itself ithaka has a lot of religious purposes and traditional beliefs tied to the chapter but i haven't really talked about it well Let's talk about it. So the world is covered in ocean. So the tribals believe that the water is sacred, even though it's very undrinkable, it's salt water after all. But this is kind of rooted into the chapter's beliefs. And whenever they're called to duty out of the world system, they will do this type of ritual where they will actually grab these tiny copper vials and scoop up the planet's water before they head out. And whenever they head out to this new planet they're going to, they will drop a little bit of water on the, f on the floor and go, okay, let's fight. And then when they're done with their mission, they'll return that vial to their planet and pour out what's left of the water into the ocean. Never is it empty. There's always water in this. But the worms themselves are very interesting. And this is where I say, if you ever commit a crime and this chapter is your judge, you're fucked. I'm just telling you this now. If you ever commit any sort of crime, or you are suspected of a crime, you're gonna die. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about this. You are gonna die. That's it. Death is definitely gonna happen to you when it comes to the pursuit of justice. So, what they do is if you're a space marine and you're convicted of being a traitor, or being treasonous, or just outright a dickhead who stole something what they're gonna do is they're gonna put you on a little tiny rock island all by yourself with no armor no weapons so you're gonna be sitting there naked as fuck and around you is gonna be a lot of worms this is known as Oethanar or known as the trial by worm this is rather well stupid but basically the worms are summoned, and the worms will swim around the island, and after a few hours of you getting omnommed by the worms, the person should be dead by six hours. Six hours is the time when you should be dead. If everyone comes back to the rock and they see you're alive after six hours, that means you're guilty. Hmm. So you're dead no matter what. So what this means is, the worms do not eat a guilty man. The worms do not touch guilty people because they don't want that taint inside their belly. That's what the religious people believe on this island. This is what the space marines believe. So if I suspect you of a terrible crime, I'm gonna put you on this rock. If you get killed by those worms, you are innocent and we're gonna hold a huge ceremony celebrating your death. We're gonna celebrate all the great achievements you did. We're gonna say how sorry we are that you had to die, but we're gonna say how great of a person you were. Now, if you're guilty, you're gonna be alive. But not only are you gonna be alive, after six hours, everyone's gonna come over and kill you because they're gonna go, oh, psh, clearly you're guilty. Bang, you're dead. Now, besides that though, you're probably thinking, well, 
These chapters kind of weird. Yeah, they really are. And we haven't even touched the surface yet. We haven't even talked about their military doctrines. Their military doctrines are very fucking odd. Their military doctrines revolve mostly around forming squad type tactics. So they don't really worry themselves with big, big war stratagems. No. Instead, they assume how many squads it's going to take to fight an enemy. This would be the chapter master who decides this. He'll go, mmm, this should take 40 guys. We'll send 40 guys in. That's four squads. Send them in. And everyone's going to have a little coin. This coin's going to be personalized so we know which coin belongs to which. And they're going to put it inside a kilix. And a kilix is a type of Greek urn, kind of type of Greek um, drinking cup. And the chapter master is going to blindly pick a few coins, and whichever coins were picked is the squads that go. Nathaniel squad, Thaddeus squad, Avidus squad, you're going. And then from there, those squads will go and do it. Now who leads those squads though? Not the chapter master, but if the chapter master is the one that gets picked, of course he'll lead the fight. But who's going to lead the squads is usually determined by, of course, just mutual benefit, like mutual respect. Okay, well, um, Thaddeus squad has the most experience, and he's the oldest. He's going to be in charge of all four. Now, as I said, this chapter mostly focuses on squad-based tactics, and this is what they excel at. They excel at squad tactics. This kind of makes it curious as to whether or not they're Rogel Dorn's children or not. And this is where it's led to some people speculate this, is that this chapter is really good at finding cover, really good at maneuvering their squads. So it wouldn't be hard to believe that maybe they're Rogel Dorn's children. The only reason why I'm against that is because if you take Rogel Dorn and you put him outside his base, his first idea is, oh god, I gotta fortify something. And he's gonna get his ass blown away. But you take Gilliman and you take him outside of a fortress, you ambush him. He may actually come out on top because he's going to use his versatile knowledge of maneuvering, of holding certain lines, hiding behind a tree, then moving onwards using the speed of like Jagatai to quickly get to the next tree, then holding that tree line like Rogodorn, then moving again. And that's something that I could definitely see why the Iron Snakes are Robert Gilliman's children. And that's why I don't like people when they say, oh, well, the way that they use squad-based tactics is more like Jagatai or Rogodorn. No, 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 no. This chapter is really good at being versatile. And this has definitely proved it. One medic, one heavy specialist, and then the rest are just normal guys. That's pretty versatile. This is why I like this chapter a bit, is that when they're at war with something, they don't really have an overarching strategy. They don't go, okay, we're going to pincer maneuver. We're going to meet our squads right here. No, they just kind of deploy themselves, and wherever they go, usually from this linear pathway, is where they're going to end up. They don't really focus too much on this grander scale. They do plan, like, okay, there's an enemy uh, tank up ahead. We're going to have to take that out. Okay, how are we going to approach it? Well, hopefully we can approach it this way, but most likely we're not going to approach it this way. And they kind of go from there. So really... A lot of people who play Halo, Call of Duty, anything like that, they could really relate to the Iron Snakes in the sense that these guys don't really plan everything, and everything they plan doesn't really go accordingly. And that's where they really shine through, is that they just go from squad-based tactics to squad-based tactics. All right, you, heavy bolter, get on that ledge, rain fire on them. You, medic, get on Jenkins, because his dumbass charged them like an idiot. And then you go on from there. Now, how do they recruit Marines, though? Well, they don't have scout Marines like everyone else. In fact, this is where it becomes a little fucking weird. They don't use scouts at all. Instead, what they have is they have a bunch of people sitting inside their chapter keep who are really more like servants. And that's all they do is they just serve you. They don't do anything. These recruits are called petitioners. And what they do is they just 
act like personal servants and they act like chapter staff. So they'll be the ones who keep the gear running, keep everything going and everything like that inside the keep. But whenever the chapter suffers deep casualties to the point that they need to elevate the petitioners into a full-fledged space marine, what they do is they take these petitioners and they put them against one another. And whoever a sergeant depicts as being, and they pick whoever is skillful. If they suspect that, yes, you lost, but you showed a lot of skill in dealing with a stronger opponent, you could actually be selected to become a full-fledged space marine. Now, once you are selected though, and you're given all these implants and all these trials, the final trial is where they give you a spear, a sea lance, and they send you out on your own, naked. And it is your job to kill a worm and bring it back to the chapter. If you do this, you pass. You are now a full-fledged space marine. So you got the Astro Knights who go out and find their obsidian dagger. And then you got these guys who go out butt-ass naked Spartan style with a fucking spear and hook a sea dragon and drag its big ass over to the chapter in honor of their full-fledged trial. Arguably, I like this chapter a lot. They're actually pretty cool, and I'm probably going to make a second lore video talking more about them. But this chapter is very interesting in the way that they operate. They're very interesting in the sense that they're very old Greek. They're really more like regular Greeks than anything. Other Robert Gilliman factions kind of hint at a Greek origin, especially the fact that Gilliman's symbol is literally an omega sign flipped upside down, or as... The Emperor would call it a toilet seat. But this chapter specifically uses a lot of Greek stuff. Like the Kilix, the Oathon. I always mispronounce it Oathon Thanar. The Trial by Worms. God, I can't fucking speak. But um, besides that, this is it for this video. I hope you guys see me again next time. We're going to do another hentai review of a very, very funny hentai that I really fucking do not like. And besides that, see you guys next time. Frieza700 signing out. Like, comment, subscribe.